So Jason, um, it's good to talk to you. Your whole career is basically built around Greenland and understanding the ice sheet. Can you start by telling us a, a little bit of the history of the ice sheet, but what that means today and tomorrow and going on? The Greenland ice sheet is a relic of the past ice age that's just surviving in the Holocene climate, which is the last 6,000 years of remarkably stable climate. And we've already lost the Laurentide ice sheet that was on top of North America. So Greenland is just in a, a meteorological setting that allows the ice just to hang on, which now today under an anthropogenic strong forcing and an abrupt increase in greenhouse heating, the Greenland ice sheet, like ice around the world, is really starting to respond. So if we had not pumped billions and billions and tons of uh, greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, would it be in a stable state? The Greenland ice sheet was stable until the 1980s. Uh, interestingly, that stability, I believe, is delivered by uh, sulfate dimming, this uh, phenomenon of, called global dimming, where by burning coal, uh, that shrouded the atmosphere with aerosols that kept the surface temperature cooler. And now that we're actually cleaning up the energy system, it means that the combination of enhanced greenhouse effect plus the removal of the aerosol masking effect ensures a steep increase in heating globally and the ice sheets, glaciers are beginning to respond. There's a delayed response from land ice and it's now a clear signal that it, it's getting very steep and that's what makes future projections really difficult. The past though, the past decades, we have quite a clear picture. Okay, and this, um, this Greenland is often cited by many people when they're talking about the impacts of climate change, but it's a very remote bedrock with a very remote ice sheet. What does it really matter anyway if we lose Greenland? Of course, the main impacts from land ice loss are felt in sea rise. And that's why uh, we get so much attention. What are the ice sheets really doing? And again, we have good numbers over the past decades. And what they show is in every decade, and for all land ice areas in the Arctic, so including Arctic Canada, Alaska, Svalbard, Iceland, all of these regions have an increasing rate of sea level contribution in every single decade. So it, it's a very clear acceleration, very not linear increase, which means that whatever changes are occurring now will have an amplified effect going into the future. So it, small changes now have big consequences later that are felt around the world. Uh, even though this is a remote, barely habitated place, uh, it is of global consequence. Okay, and, and this is really the key to this, I think. Um, when we talk about 1.5 degrees, or the Paris commitments, and there's every indication that we're quite a long way off target, probably almost double off the, the I'm not going to call it a safe zone, but let's just say what scientists say, we shouldn't go beyond. Yeah. And um, how does this accelerating melt fit into that narrative of the 1.5, the 2 degrees? Yes, uh, technically now Greenland is beyond its viability threshold because at the current level of warming in Greenland, which is about 1.4 Celsius above pre-industrial for summer temperatures, the Greenland ice sheet is losing ice equivalent to about 10,000 cubic meters of ice loss per second when you average that around the clock. That number would deliver hypothetically to all inhabitants, human inhabitants on Earth, a bathtub of water every single day, around the year, uh, every every day. And and so the um, this one the 1.4 right now in Greenland, the 
1.5 under the Paris scenario means roughly twice that in, in Greenland for summer temperatures. And that only means that, that uh, beyond the threshold state uh, is enhanced. And so that loss rate becomes some complex, um, nonlinear amplified response uh, guaranteeing the ice sheet remains beyond its viability threshold. Over enough time, the dynamic drawdown of the surface, so you start with this domed surface, dynamic drawdown ensures that more of the surface area gets exposed to the lower and warmer parts of the atmosphere, and that is the, the final straw for the ice sheet. However, that dynamic drawdown takes time, and if society is successful to put the brakes on heating by reducing emissions and getting into carbon drawdown, it, the effect is putting the brakes on, slowing down this catastrophe, and that's buying time and saving lives. Okay, and um, one of the things that I, I've heard here, and, and you, I think you've mentioned this, is that these processes are actually accelerating. And how does that accelerate in? And this feeds into one of your projects, which is faster than forecast. And I do, what I'd like to, to understand from you is what faster than forecast means and what the implications are. Can you give us an overview of that? Yes, I'm using the phrase faster than forecast to document several physical mechanisms that I've uncovered uh, also in my survey of the scientific literature, the community is delivering uh, a list of amplifiers that guarantee a more rapid response of the ice than is currently encoded in the ice sheet models used to project sea level rise. Therefore, we cannot yet rely on ice sheet models for credible sea level projections. What we do know are these physical mechanisms. One is the darkening of the surface because of the doubled melt that's occurring at the surface. That's producing uh, flooded areas, uh, saturated snow. It's kind of blue in color, so it's reflecting a lot less sunlight by virtue of the fact that it's water saturated. We're talking about the, the, the peak part of the melt season. And then rainfall, which is occurring more frequently at the expense of snowfall because temperatures are crossing that threshold, uh, that zero degree, it's a real kind of genuine tipping point uh, that makes the surface darker, it's absorbing more sunlight, amplifying melt. A similar darkness related amplifier, not in the models, is biological darkening. Microbial activity that has the capacity to expand further. In fact, it is expanding when the bare ice area, which occurs at the lowest reaches, lowest one third of elevation profile of the sheet, that area is being colonized by uh, microbes that produce a pigment to regulate photosynthesis. It's a dark pigment, it translates directly into more surface heating and more meltwater production. That effect, not in the models. Then, water infiltration into the ice sheet where the internal temperatures are, say, minus 10. This water is zero Celsius. It heats the ice internally. Warmer ice is softer, so it deforms more readily and draws down. That's referred to sometimes as thermal collapse. The, then, the water that floods the, the underside of the ice sheet, it lubricates flow. The same water uh, that emerges into the tidewater fjord environment drives a heat exchange with a warming ocean uh, entraining warm water that ablates or melts the ice right at the grounding line. This uh, leads to a loss of friction and, and an acceleration and retreat. Uh, I just listed three mechanisms, again, not in the ice sheet models to uh, a useful degree. Wow. Um, there's hydrofracture, water flooding uh, rifts that, that, because water is heavier than ice, it can open up the rifts. Um, there are other mechanisms to talk about, but as you can see, there are more than a few 
multipliers, and they actually work together in, in complex, uh, self-reinforcing ways to ensure the dynamic drawdown in this elevation feedback, which is the point of irreversibility for the ice sheet in a warming scenario. It, it becomes a matter of time until the ice sheet uh, cannot be regrown without a very long ice age, which is not yet in the cards. Sure. And it's, a, it's faster than forecast. You're taking these things that it's a highly dynamic system. Only some of it's in the models. The other parts of it are part of a, an accelerating process, which we you're just trying to understand, basically. Um, and let's step back again and, and just look at the real implications of, of this globally. And, and this, I, it's hard to, to, to express, but it, what it really means for humanity if we continue to accelerate this process by adding more and more greenhouse gases. Uh, you're here at the COP. Uh, what's your feeling between you know the anxiety that we're seeing outside amongst the protesters and the and the kind of the voice of the policymakers and the negotiators and the COP itself? How do you feel when you put it in the context of your work and the research that you're doing and the concerns you have about what you're finding out? It's important to understand that there's another piece of bad news which is called uh, gravitational fingerprints. When you remove ice from the high latitudes, it actually affects the gravity fields of the planet with the result that the sea level rise is bulging in the tropics where most people are. Yeah. And so you get 40% more sea rise in the tropics Places like the Philippines, uh, island nations, Bangladesh, high population areas, uh, the, the Mekong River Delta, uh, bread basket, rice basket of, of Asia. Uh, these areas are, um, they will be inundated to an increasing degree. And so that presents the connection of the ice with the global geopolitical uh, livelihood uh, environment. The, forced retreat of people from coastlines will of course have a disruptive uh, effect and forced migration. It is um, it threatens the you know the stability it produces conflict. So sea rise is a conflict multiplier just like um, the loss of of access to resources that we find with drought, with flooding, the destruction of crops, um, which are more immediate. The, the loss of water and food security impacts on agricultural systems more immediate. The sea rise problem is later. Um, so if it's good news at all, uh, it's that we have some time to prepare for catastrophic sea level rise, and I'm talking meters of sea level rise in the next two centuries, uh, exactly when is, is hard to define. Uh, but I, I looked at a conservative calculation this morning uh, because we're always challenged to, okay, well, what's the number? Uh, and uh, a, a conservative lower bound uh, sea rise for land ice contribution plus thermal expansion translates to about a meter of sea level rise this century. From Greenland? Uh, from all, from all of global, okay. global land ice, including Antarctica. Um, those projections, I, I say a lower bound because the Antarctic ice sheet, Greenland, other land ice, they, they, they have to continue behaving as they currently are. If we get a change in behavior, for example, um, a major ice shelf disintegration in Antarctica, uh, then the Antarctic contribution accelerates. Uh, that's, there's a, a, a lower probability of extremely high sea rise impacts, especially out of Antarctica, um, because it's eight, nine times the volume of Greenland. It, um, it's more insulated from climate change, at least in the atmosphere, because 
you have this ice continent, Antarctica, centered at the South Pole with not as much atmospheric exchange, uh, whereas in Greenland the Arctic you get huge uh, exchanges of, say, record warm North America heat drifting onto Greenland producing uh, big melts, rainfall. Antarctica is a disaster that's, that's predicted by ocean warming and there are warming ocean currents that are located offshore from Antarctica and it's a question of to what degree do these warm ocean currents impinge on the underwater sections of Antarctic ice sheet. Antarctica already loses, its, its mass loss mechanism is through the ocean primarily already and the undercutting of Antarctic ice sheet is threatened by war ocean warming and Climate change is largely a story of the oceans absorbing far more heat than the atmosphere is. 90% um, of the planetary energy imbalance is focused into ocean warming. So even if we stopped carbon emissions now, we would still have this problem of an overheated ocean, which is mainly threatening Antarctica. So uh, we're a long way from fixing climate change. I mean, this is like a fully disturbed, perturbed system. And from the policy making side, it seems like these these are like planetary boundaries. This I know there's work called planetary boundaries and faster than forecast fits into that thing. And it should be at the centre of our policy making in terms of how we plan. Is there do you have thoughts on that? Right. For risk aversion, we need policy that tries to of course limit carbon emissions and get into what I call the project of the century which should be removing carbon dioxide, carbon from the atmosphere, uh, carbon drawdown at huge scale. Uh, alarmingly, a lot of the uh, policy assumptions for the Paris Agreement uh, assume as yet proven, so, so far unproven, future technologies of negative emissions, carbon drawdown. It, it's uh, the, these assumptions that the, 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 what, what's on the table at, at the COP um, are optimistic, very optimistic uh, technological assumptions about future car carbon drawdown technologies, carbon removal technologies. Sure, sure. And of course it is dishonest because if you take those out, it tells a very different story about the way we in the developed world live and how we should actually start adapting to low carbon lifestyles rather than inflicting all this on, on the, especially the people in the tropics first. Um, so, well look, I think we've had a very good overview there, so thank you very much indeed.